Thank you for coming. We appreciate your time and presence here. I'm Seung Hae Hong. I'm a social work faculty here at UH Manoa. As we start the symposium, the Center for Korean Studies would like to honor the ancestry of our Korean Americans who came to here in um, 1903, 120 years ago. Uh, the early Korean community was enriched by several women who were leaders in education, social work, and uh, promoting Korean culture. Um, we celebrated and um, organized this symposium because the 112th celebration of Korean immigration in the is the appropriate occasion to learn more about the accomplishments of these leaders. This symposium will feature four Korean one leaders, Nodi Kim Son, Hae Su Hwang, Hala Ham, and Chan Yun Hee. Uh, we need to make some acknowledgments. Uh, so today's symposium could not be even possible without funding support from the Asia Research Foundation, Korean American Foundation Hawaii, and the Academy of Korean Studies. And of course, our amazing staff deserves our appreciation. Courtney Oshiro Chin, Hain Lee, Yejun Kwan, Janelle Lee, and Becky Dingle. Thank you deeply. And I really appreciate all your participation here today. I know you are very busy. Okay, um, as the first uh, of, of this symposium, uh, we will have the uh, film Songs of Love from Hawaii. It's called Hawaii Yonga in Korean language. And we will have the film of Songs of Love and then uh, we will have the director, Jin Young Won Lee, here and say a few words about the film. And we are really grateful for the opportunity to share this beautiful film with you all. Um, who dedicate their you know, time and knowledge and all that um, to keep the Korean American history alive. Also, I'd like to thank the violinist Lee Ki who is here with us today. for not only um, agreeing to be the focal point of this documentary, but also um, bringing such beautiful music to honor um, all those who came before us, including the four female leaders that I'm about to learn today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Malo Nui, Director Lee. And, uh, Center pr uh, prepared this brochure about the film, so uh, please uh, make sure to pick up for your use. Uh, uh, next, uh, we'd like to have welcoming remarks from uh, Director Taeung Lee, and uh, we will have him here on stage. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Korean Studies. My name is Taeyong Baek, uh, the director of this center. And I'm also a professor of law uh, at the University of Hawaii. As you know, uh, in 2003, uh, 2005 actually, uh, January 13th is uh, announced to be the Korean American Day. And uh, every year, uh, many uh, counties and uh, cities uh, declare the date over and over again uh, to be the Korean American Day, and we also have celebrated it in Hawaii. And especially the celebration here in Honolulu started in December last year because the uh, early Korean immigrants uh, start, uh, departed Korea in December to arrive in Korea on January 13th, and it was a uh, real kind of, you know, impressive journey that they have had started in 1903. But it was a very short-lived uh, process because the Korean immigration stopped in January 
uh, in, in uh, 1905. However, those uh, uh, 7,000 some uh, Korean immigrants had cultivated uh, the life in this country and their identities as a Korean as well as, as a Hawaiian. And also, they uh, show the models of the relationship the Korean community can build uh, with uh, the main current of the society and the United States or uh, whole uh, uh, people in this uh, country. Uh, we have uh, been working together with the Korea American Foundation in Hawaii and uh, uh, many other local Korean uh, community organizations to celebrate this. And one of the uh, events that we have agreed upon to hold here at the center was to feature some of the stories of Korean immigrants, especially this year, uh, owing to suggestions from uh, Professor uh, Ned Schulcher and also uh, Mrs. Dakili Murabayashi, we decided to focus on the immigrant, Korean immigrant, uh, female immigrant readers who had done very important work uh, during the turbulent, difficult times, but uh, less known, uh, in fact. Uh, and uh, uh, we have been uh, publishing on this materials here and there, but this event will be a good opportunity for us to think a little bit more about the roles of Korean immigrant leaders uh, and the challenges they had gone through in this uh, beautiful land, but also uh, challenging uh, new environment. And my center has been working very hard to document the lives of early Korean immigrants and uh, had been accumulating collections of uh, those Korean immigrant stories. We have currently more than 50 collections uh, owing to your donations and your support. And uh, this event will also generate some awareness that our past history is a treasure of all of us. And I hope you will continue to nurture that uh, treasure uh, through this type of work. Thank you again for coming today. And I also thank again uh, for generous support given for this event from uh, Asian uh, Research Foundation as well as Korean American uh, Foundation in Hawaii. And uh, uh, there were also various uh, actors involved for this event, especially my staff, including Professor Sung Ye Hong and also uh, Ye Jun and uh, other uh, center staff, uh, Hayne, Courtney, and uh, Becky, and many uh, students had been working very hard to make this ev event possible. So I thank again for their uh, wonderful work. So please give you a big applause. Thank you. So without further ado, I will just pass along the microphone to, back to Professor Hong. Thank you again for coming, and I hope you will enjoy this event. Next, I'd like to, I deli I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Edward Schultz. Uh, he is an emeritus faculty at University of Hawaii at Manoa, and he is a vice president of Asia Research Foundation and president of Korean American Foundation Hawaii. Let's welcome uh, Ned Schultz. Aloha, aloha kako, and of course, anya smika. Uh, it's an unexpected pleasure to be here and uh, to talk to you just very, very briefly. I thought I was coming as a representative of the Korean American Foundation, Hawaii. Uh, but I, I saw by this, I'm also representing the uh, Asian Research Foundation. Uh, just, uh, just by chance, I happen to be active in both organizations. Uh, so let me just... Uh, tell you a little bit about the Korean American Foundation Hawaii first, because we are active, and I just happen to be what we call in Korea the Kao Madam. I just happen to be the representative of this organization, but there, there are many, many fine people. And uh, Jin Young Lee's uh, documentary, uh, the Korean American Foundation gave initial support to. 
and uh, we've been very active in supporting. Uh, I, I also mentioned very briefly KBFD's uh, Picture Bride, which we also supported. The, for the last two years, the Korean American Foundation did nothing because of the pandemic. So we thought we should make a big splash celebrating the 120th anniversary of Korean immigration. And hence, we supported both these, these, these two great films. Um, we also uh, try to support Korean community events in, in, in Hawaii. And we uh, just finished celebrating the 120th anniversary with a major banquet at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. Uh, some of you were there. We also helped uh, show Marie Ann Yu's uh, photos at City Hall, and that exhibition is still going on. So if you have a chance, go to City Hall and, and see these, these uh, great pictures from 1956, 57, and also other photos showing Hawaii's experience, Koreans, Koreans in Hawaii. So that was the first hat I wore. And the second hat, as it's mentioned here, and I only discovered that this morning, <laughs> that I'm the vice president of the Asian Research Foundation. And uh, that, that's an organization that's been around in Hawaii for about 20 years. And we primarily try to support uh, Korean history, Korean culture, Korean, Korean literature, uh, both here in Hawaii and, and around, the, around the world. And we've been very active in, in sponsoring, uh, basically, this uh, trying to bring dialogue between North and South Korea. So there, there's all sorts of things that we're doing. And this, Particular organ this particular function today just seemed like so timely. For so often, men have dominated what we know about Korea. But in our hearts, we all know that the men are just representing the power at home. At least in my case, in, in uh, Ducky Moribayashi's husband's case, it's the, the woman at home who really ends up commanding what goes along. And so we thought in support of, in, of the 120th anniversary, let's change the focus and focus on the women in Hawaii. And it's very timely because, as I mentioned before, KBFD came out with a great documentary on Picture Bride, which uh, was shown at, the, at HIF, the Hawaii International Film Festival, uh, last fall. And uh, th there's just so many other ways in which women, as you all know, <laughs> Looking at this audience, I don't need to say anything more about the importance of women. Uh, so I, I want to congratulate the Center for Korean Studies for taking up this challenge, uh, Sung Hae for, for being the leader, uh, my ever faithful Mrs. Motobayashi, who basically had the whip to get people together. And uh, I think you'll have a very enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. Hello, Nui Luan, Ed Okay, um, let's get started in, right into the symposium, the program. And I'd like to introduce the first speaker of today, um, Mrs. Murabayashi, Dr. Lee Murabayashi. And uh, she's a long um, uh, community member for the Korea, uh, Center for Korean Studies. And she's the president of KIRI, K-I-R-I-H, Korean research, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Korean Immigrant uh, Immigration Research Institute in Hawaii. Okay, uh, please come on here and uh, please uh, let's welcome Mrs. Murabayashi. In the past 20 years, we have talked a lot about early women immigrants, how hard they worked to support their families, how wisely they carried on women's organizational activities, etc. In the process, we have somewhat neglected to learn about some women leaders who enriched the Korean community in the fields of education, social work, Korean culture, and even in ethno-autobiographical writing. It is time to highlight these women leaders while we are celebrating the 120-year immigration history. Prior to presentations on these women leaders, it is my pleasure to provide an overview on Korean women immigrants in Hawaii. Thank you. 한인들이 하와이 오기 시작한 것이 이제 1903년 1월 13일인 것은 여러분들이 잘 아시는데요. 1903년부터 1905년 여름까지 약 7,600명 이 숫자는 
어느 어, 자료를 사용하느냐에 따라서 다른데 7,400여 명 중에서 7,600명까지 됩니다. 어쨌든 7,600명이 왔어요. 그 중에는 어, 대부분이 남성이 한 6,800명이었고요. 어, 부인들은 600명이 조금 넘는 넘게 왔습니다. 그리고 어린 아이들이 한 160병. 그래서 어쨌든 간에 1903년에서 1905년까지 온 초기 이민 총수는 약 7,600명으로 어, 지금 계산이 되어 있습니다. 그런데 그 어, 7, 이 7,600여 명이 와가지고 1910년 미국의 인구 조사를 할 때까지 2,280명이 환국을 한 것으로 지금 어, 기록이 남아 있습니다. 그 2,280명 중에 약 2,000명은 남성이었고 한 160명이 부인 그리고 160명의 아이들이 이제 아버지와 같이 어, 환국을 했고요. 800명은 본토로 재이민을 갔습니다. 그래서 1910년 인구조사에 4,533명 으로 우리 하와이의 한인들이 살고 있는 것으로 이제 조사가 되어 있습니다. 그 4,533명 중에 한 300명은 하와이에서 낳은 아이들이기 때문에 한국에서 온 사람은 4,200명으로 시작했다 그렇게 생각을 하시면 됩니다. 그리고 1910년에서 24년 사이에 약 800명이 다시 어, 다시간 1910년에서 24년, 1924년 사이에 800명이 한국에서 이제 하와이로 들어오는데 그 중에 680명이 어, 이른바 사진 신부라고 합니다. 그래서 어쨌든 처음에 1910년에 4,500명, 한국 출신 4,200명에서 이 800명을 더하면은 5,000명이 우리 하와이의 한국 사회를 어, 한인 커뮤니티를 어, 시작을 했다고 어, 그렇게 봅니다. 네, 여성들이 이제 오면서 이렇게, 어, 어, 같이 뭐 에바 농장이 한 36개 이 이민자들이 한 36개 어, 여러 이 농장으로 흩어져 살았는데요. 그 중에 이제 부인들의 사진이 좀 남아 있습니다. 아까 말씀드렸듯이 이제 1910년에 4,533명, 1920년에는 4,950명 이렇게 이제 인구가 불어나기 시작, 증가하기 시작을 합니다. 그런데 그렇다면은 이제 이 여성들 우리 한 사진 신부 680명 그 전에 있던 한 100여 명의 여성들이 무엇을 했나 이렇게 보면은. 여성들 자신들이 자신의 단체를 조직을 했어요. 처음으로 조직된 단체가 신명부인회라는 단체였는데 1908년 이전에 조직이 된 것으로 우리가 추정을 합니다. 근데 정확하게 기록이 남아있지 않아서 목적이 무엇이었고 누구누구가 회원이었나 한 기록은 없습니다만은 하여튼 신명부인회 새 신자의 밝을 명자가 아닌가 그렇게 생각을 합니다. 신명부인회가 1908년 이전에 뭐 7년이나 그때 조직이 됐고요. 또 1909년 4월에는 부인 교육회라 그래 가지고 어 그러니까 부인들이 자, 자신의 교육과 자식, 자식들 자녀들의 교육에 중점을 둬야 한다 하는 뜻으로 부인 교육회가 어 조직이 됐습니다. 이두 단체 외에 다른 두 단체가 있었다고 하는데 정확하게 이름은 밝혀져 있지 않고요. 또 그들의 목적도 우리가 지금 알수 없습니다. Anyway, 1913, uh, there was a Dan Buinhe and lasted until 1913 because the 1913 when they learned the Korean independence movement in March 9th, The Dehan Buinhe uh, reorganized uh, into Korean Women's Relief Society. And this Korean Women's Relief Society lasted until 1970 when there were about 10, 20 members left, early immigrant women left. 
And this organization is the uh, woman's organization who actually collected about $200,000, which is about $4 million today's dollar worth. There is no other organization raised this much, including National Association or Dong Jiuhe, the male organization. This is the woman who did all the work, believe me. <laughs> I got the warning, 10 minutes. The uh, women's reliefs, they actually had a uniform too, and they had a headband. They, they even had a flag a, and uh, the membership card. This is the only membership, any organization membership card in color. <laughs> Woman power. And that poster is an independence declaration poster. Only this kind had the poster form and including the Korean flag and the uh, Mugunghwa, national flower. Okay. Cool. Maui branch. Korean Women's Society, actually Relief Society, studied a new fashion, modernized Korean dress, simplified a shorter length and shorter sleeve length. They marched. So whenever there is a the community function, the woman represented the Korean community. They even played a, a play to raise funds. All those are the female members. And there was a Korean YWC. And you see the woman in the back in the early 1921, actually, they, and they organized all these activities. YWC carried on cultural world, and later on, so we'll cover this. In addition to this separate women's organization, actually the backbone of the Korean community was women in each churches. There's a Methodist churches, an Episcopal church, and the independent Korean Christian church. This is a Methodist church, the present Keamoko Christ United Methodist Church. Episcopal Church is a, a present St. Luke Church on Judd Street, Nuanu and Judd. This Korean Christian Church, Lilia, the Korean Church on the Lilia Street. So as you can see, Korean women actually covered all fields, and the individual presentation will cover more detail. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jamsuk Kim. She is a historian and uh, associate professor at Myeongji University. She came from uh, South Korea all, to, all uh, to here to share the story of Nodi Kim. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Please come here. Hi, mahalo. Yes, I just learned. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I have 20 minutes. It's a really short time. Uh, so I try to make it. Yes, let's start. Uh, I'm very pleased and excited to talk about Nodi Kim today. Almost 10 years ago, I wrote a short uh, paper about her. I think that's why I'm invited here today. The title is Nodi Kim, a Korean-American female educator in Hawaii. I examined her life with an emphasis on her contribution in the Korean independence movement and also in Korean-American education in Honolulu. 
Before moving to my presentation, I would like to express my gratitude. Many thanks to many people who have worked to prepare for this conference, especially the Professor Sung Hong uh, and the Director Professor Taehyung Baek, uh, also the Professor uh, Edward Schultz and the Dr. Lee Murabashi. Actually, uh, my presentation has uh, th uh, three parts. Uh, I already examined her early life and her activities in the United States in my first papers. So uh, this uh, today, uh, I am focusing on the third part. The third part uh, is about her activities in Korea. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't have enough materials uh, uh, to examine her activities in Korea. Uh, so today, uh, I just uh, uh, to clarify her role in uh, her activities, I will focus on the organization in which she worked as the head of the uh, organization. Next, I will introduce a photo album of uh, her trip to Jeju because the photos implied what she did in Korea. This is uh, her early life. Uh, actually, uh, before uh, I jumped to her life, I want to talk about her name. I think you already know her English name. But uh, uh, we need to pay attention to her Korean name. Uh, there are two Korean names uh, in this slide. I highlighted the one in red color, another one in yellow color. So uh, you can uh, find her uh, Korean name highlighted in yellow. Uh, in old Korean newspapers. But as far as I uh, confirm, uh, she used uh, the node D uh, highlighted in red, not yellow. But unfortunately, uh, you can see uh, her the Certificate of National Merit awarded by the Korean government in 2021, the Ministry of Patriotic Service imprinted her name uh, like, uh, okay, I don't know how to, like this. It's uh, the Nodi uh, highlighted in yellow. I think uh, it's wrong. Uh, so. Uh, I want to say her correct Korean first name is the red one. Okay, you can see the red one. And then, uh, the Mraibashi already told she moved to Hawaii on 1905 with her family. Uh, here is her family photos. Uh, she moved to Hawaii with her parents and a uh, brother and one sister. And right after, uh, right after she arrived uh, at Honolulu, she enrolled in Kaumano School. Uh, actually, for the, this presentation, uh, I arrived here January 3rd. Uh, so I have uh, plenty of time to visit the historic sites relating to uh, know this life in Honolulu. Uh, so uh, one of them is uh, the Wesley, Susanna, uh, Susanna Wesley home. Uh, because uh, when Nodi uh, enrolled in Kaumano school, uh, her daddy's uh, the plantation was uh, far away from the school. So temporarily, she stayed at the Susanna Wesley home. Many scholars use uh, these photos, uh, but this uh, Sanna Wesley home uh, is not, was not the house she stayed. Uh, 
uh, because uh, Sanna Wesley home moved to 1990, uh, the place. Uh, so uh, I think uh, she stayed in the place uh, that I brought to, from the Sanna Wesley home, the black and white. So there are uh, three uh, Korean women and two Korean kids. Uh, this morning, I tried to find uh, Dodi Kim in this photo, uh, and I just uh, thought, me to figure out her uh, next. Uh, and then uh, uh, I've been to uh, the archives of the uh, state of Hawaii and found uh, some term reports. Uh, she uh, graduated the Kaumano School in June of 1915. Uh, according to the term report, uh, there, was, there were only 36 Korean students out of 858 total students enrolled in Kaumano School. That means Kaumano School is really big school, uh, and the Korean is really rare, and uh, Dodi Kim is one of them. After graduating Kaumano School, she moved to Ohio for her education. Before she moved to Ohio, she encountered uh, her mentor, Dr. Seungman Lee. Letter of recommendation written by Dr. Sungman Lee played a major role in Nudi receiving an academic scholarship. Uh, I brought uh, her statement uh, in the blue box. Shows that she considered Sungman Lee as her mentor. She graduated from, uh, and then she moved to Ohio, and she. Uh, enrolled uh, Worcester High School there. Uh, she uh, graduated uh, Worcester High School uh, in 1918, and then she enrolled uh, at Oberlin College. She got her uh, bachelor's degree on, in Oberlin College in 1922. The far left photo uh, was uh, taken in 1922. Uh, from now, I want to talk about her activities in the United States uh, very briefly. To talk about her contribution uh, to the Korean independence movement, first, I think we need to pay attention to the first Korean Congress held in Philadelphia from April 14th to 16th in 1919. The Congress was held by Dr. Seungman Rhee and Mr. Jason Pilip in an effort to appeal for Korea to be free from Japan. During her, uh, the Nudi Kim was invited to the Congress as a female delegate. During her first day, she gave a speech that made her recognizable to everyone at the Congress. You can see uh, the Sinan Minbo reported the news of the first uh, Korean Congress uh, here. Another Another famous figure is definitely Seungman Lee here. And the next, one, next guy is Jason Philip. Uh, Jason Philip and Dr. Seungman Lee held this uh, uh, Congress. And then uh, lastly, I need to say about him. He is the most famous patriot in Hawaii. I think uh, the Doki Muraibashi recognized him, right? The Reverend Chan Ho Min, 
so uh, uh, I can we can see our main participants of the first Korean Congress in this photo, and uh, uh, below. Uh, the Sinan member reported Nodi Kim's activities. Also, the American newspapers reported her activities and her uh, speech. That's why I said uh, this Congress made her very famous figure. After the Congress, she acted as a speaker at every opportunity. That's why uh, I wrote to the title, Voice of Korea. That is her role at that time. During her speech, uh, she emphasized two things. At, uh, first, she informed the situation of her homeland, uh, Joseon, under Japanese colonial rule, and appealed to Americans to help her country. Uh, and secondly, she she emphasized the women's role in Korean independence movement. She returned to Honolulu in 1922 from Ohio. Uh, in Honolulu, her biggest role was educating Korean American. She, was, uh, she worked for Korean Christian Institute, uh, which was founded by Dr. Sungman Lee. Uh, she uh, took uh, the job as a superintendent for KCI uh, for nearly 23 years. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, also, I got uh, these documents uh, from the archives of Hawaiian Mission. Uh, when uh, the Nodi Kim just started the work in KCI, uh, she wrote to this uh, letter uh, to Kessel Foundation. The foundation is a long-time supporter of KCI. Uh, you can see her uh, signature uh, on the bottom of the documents. Besides working as a superintendent, she was affiliated with many organizations in Korean uh, communities of Honolulu. You can see the detailed list of uh, her activities on this slide. But to save my time, I just want to skip. But one thing, one organization uh, I should uh, mention because uh, she uh, served uh, as a member of the uh, organization. Uh, the doc uh, Munayabashi already mentioned uh, is Tehan uh, Buin uh, So the right hand side, uh, you can see the photos. Uh, actually, I got the photo from the library of uh, Center for Korean Studies. The, this uh, uh, la the center made a digital collection of the uh, Hanbuin Gujehe, and I found the uh, Nodi Kim's uh, inside the photo. You can figure out? Yes, young lady is Nodi Kim. Uh, that's why, thanks for the Center for Korean Studies. Uh, and uh, she, uh, as the executive member, and sometimes she was a uh, president of the organization, and she collected the fund for Korean independent movement. Also herself donated her money to for the, uh, her motherland. In recognition of her effort to the motherland, the Korean government awarded her a patriotic medal as the National Order of Merit in 2021. I have only two minutes. Yes, <laughs> because uh, the, this chapter is the uh, most important part uh, that I want to really talk about. Uh, yes. We already know she was uh, uh, appointed uh, as a high-level uh, uh, officer in uh, Sungman Lee's administration in 
but I think nobody pay attention uh, what she did uh, in the office. To clarify uh, her role uh, in Korean government, we need to know uh, what, why the Korean government made uh, the uh, office. The office name is Office of Foreign Procurement. Actually, the mission is to uh, procure the foreign goods uh, with aid funds, with Korean money. But actually, uh, Korean government didn't have enough money by myself. So usually the money came from uh, the aid funds. But the United States government didn't want to transfer the work, the procuring work, to Korean government. Uh, they handled the money directly. Uh, but uh, 1949, uh, October 1949, Dr. Burns, who was the head of ECA mission to Korea, announced that the US government would hand, uh, hand over the procurement work to Korea. That's why Korean government made a new government agency. Uh, as I already said, uh, Dondi Kim was the fifth administrator of OFP. But important thing is, before she was appointed, the OFP cannot, couldn't procure the foreign uh, materials uh, with the fine at the aid funds because the U.S. government didn't transfer. Uh, and the right after, the Korean war broke out, uh, and all the uh, affairs relating to aid uh, transferred to the United Nations command. But the command didn't want to transfer the mission. Uh, but uh, finally, uh, at the end of 1953, the UN commander transferred the work to Korean government. Uh, that's why the office uh, has more had a more important role. Uh, at that time, the Sungman Lee uh, appointed her because he believed uh, her and he knew her abilities. So. While she was working, she, uh, she went through. Ah, uh, so uh, when she was uh, head of OFP, uh, the process, procedures and regulations uh, to carry out the procurement from abroad uh, uh, just uh, made. That's her role, I think. But while she was working, uh, she went through various conflict with the another ministry, especially Ministry of Commerce and uh, Industry. So she need to left uh, the February of 1955. Yes, uh, and then uh, this time I would like to introduce some photos uh, taken during her trip to Jeju Island. Uh, that photo uh, is uh, including 85 photos. Uh, and I think this photo was taken right after she resigned the uh, job. But uh, she uh, visited several places. Uh, this, uh, she uh, first visited the uh, Jeju Dojisa residence. And she visited the province hall of Jeju-do, and she gave a, a speech. Uh, and then she uh, visited another place that was uh, the Jeju Gyeongchalcheong, uh, Jeju Provincial Police, and she gave another speech there. Uh, and so she visited the Songsampo. Uh, in Songsampo, she also visited uh, the police station to encourage uh, police. And you can see the many audience is waiting to hear her speech. And she visited uh, uh, Sogipo also. And first, she visited uh, the police station. 
and then give uh, the research. In the middle of the photo has an explanation about her speech. She spoke, she is uh, speaking uh, about doctors' uh, present least uh, effort for Korean independence. And then uh, she visited the uh, Offentage uh, house and then uh, two factories. So uh, why uh, I brought these photos? Uh, because uh, those photos uh, tell many stories, yes, uh, that we didn't know about her. Uh, that's why I brought. So I think uh, uh, I'm just stand the, the starting point to, to research uh, about her uh, because the photos implied many things to me. Thank you for uh, hearing my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kim. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Trina Nam Mio. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, Hee Soo Hwang, the first Korean social worker in Hawaii. And uh, she's a retired faculty from Hawaii Community College. Please welcome uh, Dr. Trina uh, Nam Mijo. So I'm hoping I won't talk too fast to try and fit everything I have to say about my grand aunt, Hee Soo Hwang. But I'll try my best. So aloha, everyone. I try to wake you up, you know, it's uh, mid, mid uh, presentation time. And uh, also, annyeonghaseyo. So we have this combination of identities uh, that we're dealing with the Koreans who immigrated to Hawaii. And so it is my great pleasure. I'm wondering, is it better speaking closer or further away? sound-wise. Um, <clears throat> and I welcome this opportunity to which this presentation made me delve deeper into my family's history, which is really just a small piece of the total immigrant story of every family here. And uh, the great courage and tenacity it took to create new lives in a new place. So most of my information shared in this presentation was gathered by interviews with Heisu. Um, we called her Tutu. And my mother and her um, sister Mary called her Como, which means brother sister. And and so I interchangeably will, will refer to her uh, in the slideshow as Como Tutu Heisu. <laughs> and <clears throat> uh, the other information I got was from my cousins, uh, Gail Huang and Peggy Choi. So without further ado, I'm going to tell you something about her early life. It's not shifting. Am I supposed to point it at there or there? OK. Maybe. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to show a slide of the Yalu River, or Am Rock River, as it's called in Korean. And um, there are no early pictures of Heisu. So I'm going to speak and tell you some of the have family information we have um, about her early life. And then I'll show you some slides of her when uh, <clears throat> we started to have pictures of her. OK, so her story begins on October 25, 1891, when she was born to Huang Kyu Chung and Kim Shi in Huiju, a town in Pyongyang province. And North Korea um, has the river as the border between uh, China and North Korea. So they live close to the border of China. 
and she was the seventh of nine children. This river played a great part in establishing both our family history in the context of Korean history as we grew up hearing the great feat of our grandfather, her brother, Sa Sun, who escaped across this river in the winter when it was frozen, disguised as a Chinese man to elude the invading Japanese soldiers coming down from China with his five-month pregnant wife, and they escaped to Shanghai. The following year, they were able to get a ship and um, Sasun and his wife and landed in San Francisco around 1913. So interesting with uh, Duki's statistics, I, I didn't know there weren't that many Koreans who came during that period. <clears throat> Okay, according to her, her father was a village leader and ambassador to China, who she revered, and she talked about laying in his bed and touching his feet. At an early age, she was recognized as being very bright and was the first girl child to read and write in her village. Of course, the boys, it was taken for granted that they all went to school. So she was um, <clears throat> greatly influenced by her older sister, Sa Sung, who was about eight years older than her and quite a trailblazer herself. At 16, Sa Sung was married to the county mayor of Huiju, a very rich man. She was severely treated by her mother-in-law, and she left her husband in those days at 16 uh, because he took a concubine. Concubinage was a common and much accepted practice amongst upper class males at that time. Heisu remembers when she was about eight years old that her sister told her, when you grow up, don't get married. Go to school and help your country. So she was very ahead of her time. Heisu took those words to heart because she had seen the suffering of her sister at the hands of her in-laws. In fact, her in-laws tied Sasung up in her house and tried to burn her and the house down because she was the first Christian in their town. But she escaped her and continued her efforts to Christianize the town. So when Hesu was 13 years old, her father died, and her elder brother, who became the head of the household, told her, you can't go to school. And she was determined to go. So the next day, she and her, her sister snuck out of the house at about 4 a.m. and traveled for three days to a Christian mystery ministry uh, about uh, 80 miles away. And I have a very wonderful clip of her telling uh, about this. Hopefully. <laughs> but the next day, she and I went away. We got up early in the morning about 4 o'clock. I hardly see anyone. We walked three days to Chuncheon, where the missionaries stayed. And they established school for girls. So then they had a what they called convention. And so my sister came to our house, and my brother said, no, she cannot go. She's a girl, we won't do that. It's a disgrace for the family. Well, then we got up early in the morning, we ran away. And when I left home, I didn't wear the shoes, because if I wear shoes, the noise with my brother. I was afraid, so that I just all my shoes. We went, she and I went to a, uh, about 180 miles. No, no, less than that, I'm sorry. But that's the Korean mileage. That'll be about 80 miles. Well, we went three days. My sister was a young woman, good looking woman. I was about 13. We walked three days. We went to a little. Okay, 
Okay, so that was Hey Sue talking when uh, she was about 83 years old. She lives to 93. And um, at 18, she was in, invited to take a teaching job in Pusan. Is the sound better? Yeah, it keeps echoing. Yeah. By a wealthy woman who started a school for girls, and she worked there for a year and saved money in hopes of attending college in the U.S. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so she was the first Korean woman to attend college. And in 1919, she went to Athens College uh, for Women in Alabama. And here it shows a college picture of her wearing the taeguk-ki. So you see, she was proud of her Korean culture, even in the Western world. Uh, so this, she studied humanities and social work. And then she started work in 1922 uh, to be the first Korean social worker at the YWCA in Honolulu. And she worked there for 24 years. <clears throat> uh, meanwhile, back in San Francisco, so you'll, you'll see that the family was split between San Francisco and Hawaii. Um, this is a picture of her older brother, the one that uh, went over the Yalu River with his wife, who was pregnant. And they had my mother, who is the girl, and the boy, uh, Paul. Uh, interesting... Sai Young, who is in this picture, uh, sitting down uh, with, the, with Sa Sasan's two cousins, girl cousins. Uh, they were both ministers. Sasan stayed in San Francisco, and Sa Young was a firebrand minister uh, in Hawaii. He was a proclaimed communist. And um, Sasan was a patriot and was um, active in the independence movement. So even though they both were ministers, they had very di diverse views. <clears throat> okay, this was the big event where my mother uh, and my aunt and uncle's mother died when they were about nine and six, and they boarded by themselves a ship to go across the Pacific uh, for seven days to live with Heisu in Hawaii. So when um, their mother died of overwork, she was a seamstress and an embroiderer, the father, Sasan, uh, tried to throw himself on the grave. And so Heisu happened to be in San Francisco at that time, and she said, send the girls to me in Hawaii, and I, I'll raise them because Sasan was uh, getting ready to marry them off. <laughs> and <clears throat> they would have just, you know, become housewives rather than becoming uh, educated. <clears throat> so this shows um, Tutu with my Aunt Mary on the left and my mother, Elizabeth, on the right. And she raised them as a single woman in the 20s. And she chose that. She chose her career over um, getting married. And she became, again, very instrumental in the Korean community, <clears throat> working with immigrant women, many of them picture brides. And um, So uh, Hisu, as uh, Tutu, as we called her, was always stylishly dressed. <laughs> Thank you. And can you hear me if I'm not so close to the mic, or is it better? Yeah, because it keeps to me echoing. Okay. So she was stylishly dressed and uh, cut her hair. You know, she had bobbed hair and uh, was known for her warmth and compassion. And um, in those days, she amazingly was able to buy real estate and so um, raised the girl in a house on Dole Street, very close to the university here. And then later she bought a house in Waikiki. <coughs> she worked for the International Institute for 24 years and um, 
She also started activities at the Y, organizing mixed events, and became well known for staging elaborate cultural activities. So uh, like this, they would uh, have international festivals, uh, all in uh, dress, the traditional cultural dress. So Korean identity was a very important aspect of what she brought to being a social worker. As stated in the previous picture, there are over 2,000 people that came to these events. And here's another example of a pageant she put together, this one featuring uh, Indian culture. So my tutu is on the left, and they're all wearing saris, and my mother's on the right. <clears throat> they also presented evening-length uh, dramatizations of famous Korean myths like Sim Chung. Here's an actual script from 1933, where she had written the uh, narrative for the play. And then in 1933, she started the Hyung J Club in Honolulu. And again, my mother is on the extreme right. But again, her goal was to um, express Koreanness through music and dance. And she knew that people would accept the culture better through uh, art activities, culture. Okay, her legacy is, this is um, <clears throat> her when she's about 88 years old, five years before she died. And this is Mary's and Elizabeth's children. I'm in the back, uh, below the holly guy <laughs> who I married. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then all our children. So uh, Hey Sue is right below my, next to me, uh, under my husband, Jerry. And then uh, my brother, my mother is on the right, next to one of the nephews, and Auntie Mary is um, holding the dog. <laughs> also, very important was the fact that my cousin, Uncle Paul, and Auntie Ruthie, my cousin Diane, and Brenda, went back to North Korea in 1989 uh, when they had that short window where it was open. And so that picture of the Yalu River was taken when they went there. So it was a big family event to try and find the family homestead. I don't have time, but there's some funny stories about it as well. Uh, this is the, uh, my uncle and aunt with the... Uh, um, Children's Palace and in Kumgansan with the North Korean children. Oh, I do want to mention why I included this trek to the motherland is because all of our family still hopes that there is a reunification between the Koreas because we are one people. And uh, it is close to our hearts, and it's heartbreaking, actually, that uh, the Koreans are separated. <clears throat> uh, lastly, in terms of her le legacy, ironically, her two grand nieces, myself and my cousin Peggy, have become internationally known for our own choreography, which mixes Korean motifs, costuming, themes, history, uh, this is a piece called Chungshin Day about the Korean sex slaves during World War II, and uh, it was shown internationally um, and is on YouTube if you want to see it. Um, and also my cousin, interesting enough, choreographed about the same theme around the same time, and we had not even talked to each other. So this is Peggy, and she did a piece called Songhua, Rape, Race, Rage and Revolution, and um, her note is that Songwa means um, <clears throat> she wanted to stress the um, compassion after great suffering as the theme, and it's inspired by the Korean folk dance of Saopuri and uh, shaman ceremonies for the dead. So the dance is a ritual funeral for the Chungshin Day. And uh, did I, I make my time? 
<laughs> um, and there we go. That's uh, the end of it. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Mary Jo Freshly, and she's a director of Halaham Korean Dance Studio. <laughs> they are dancing. <laughs> they are all dancers. And uh, please welcome Mary Jo. 안녕하세요. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank my tech lady, Denise Miyahana, who put together the PowerPoint because I have no clue about doing any of that. So thank you, Denise. Mahalo. I first met Halaham as a student at the University of Hawaii here in Manoa in the summer of 1962. However, I had seen her perform in May of that year, a few weeks before, at Orvis Auditorium in a program called Festival of Music and Art of the Century, where she danced in the premiere of Windrum Song, or Win Windrum Suite, which was a dance drama composed by Alan Hovannis, an Ar Armenian-American composer who was in residence in the music department that spring. When I saw her perform, I was totally engrossed with her command of the stage and her movements. Although she was wearing a white hanbok, her movements were very abstract to coincide with the music that had been written. There are a couple pictures there. When I found that she was teaching Korean dance in the summer, I signed up. Halaham, or Pei Youngja, was born in 1922 in Busan, and at the age of five, she and her siblings uh, were sent to Japan to be raised by her cousin, sister, whoever she was, Pei, uh, Pei Kuja, who had a dance studio in Tokyo. Pei Kuja had studied Western dance and also had her own dance troupe. And here are a couple pictures of Halaham's family. We're still trying to figure people out. Hala was very homesick to be so young and away from her parents, which she mentioned in some interviews. However, she seemed to have talent for dance and music and the choreographer, choreography of her sister, so she had performance experience from a very early age. And here she is, a 14-year-old dancer. Pei Kuja choreographed what I would call dance dramas, as did Hala Hum, showing little bits of culture, such as our village scenes that we still do, with the feeling of being at the marketplace, buying and selling of wares, young girls with water jugs going to the village well to draw water. And because we don't have much information about Pei Kuja's dances, I'm not sure of the theme of the piece that you're going to look at, but... Here is the photo from the 1930s of one of Pei Kuja's dances, and Halaham uh, was in it, and you see the arrow pointing to her. Hala was given the name Pei Kuja II and was expected to take over the studio, and she did earn a, a degree in home economics from Jitsun Women's University, but then she returned to Korea. Back in Korea, she met a young Korean-American, John Hum, who was in the military. They married in 1948 in Korea, and a gentleman named Ed Yamaguchi, who was best man in their wedding, called us one day and said he had pictures of the wedding, would I like them? And I practically jumped out of my seat and said, yes, yes. So he brought some pictures of the wedding in 1948 in Korea. He's the best man. We haven't figured out who the maid of honor is yet. Uh, Hala did not intend to teach Korean dance here, but she did first do flower arrangement. And then she started to informally teach dance to a few students, and as people in the community became more, uh, began to recognize her ability, she was more in demand to teach, which she did in several locations. Her first major recital was 1953 as part of the Korean Golden Jubilee to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Korean immigration to Hawaii, and that was at the Acad uh, Hawaii Academy of Arts. Uh, and she did a few other performances there, but here's a copy of the program cover. And also, she posed many times at the Academy for art classes. She also showed her acting abilities as Lotus Blossom in the Honolulu Community Theater's production of The Tea House of the August Moon in 1954 and had positive reviews in the local newspapers. 
Barbara Smith, who started the ethnomusicology program here at UH, had seen Hala dance and asked her to teach Korean dance as part of that program. And around 1960, Hala Hum began teaching here at the university. Thus began Hala's involvement in teaching not only students who came to her studio, but she was able to educate more students here at the university about Korean culture in her classes. Barbara Smith also organized a lot of multicultural programs in the music department, and Korean dance was often featured. And Barbara Smith also sometimes helped Hallahum in studio events. Next. And as her studio grew, there were performances at many events, state fairs, community events, fundraising for the Korean Orphans Association. And then she decided to invite well-known dancer Kim Chan-hun to come here to train her dancers at a, for a recital. And although she had had recitals in 1960, 61, 62, uh, this was the first time that she invited a visiting uh, person to come and train uh, her dancers. Mr. Kim had started his training as a young court dancer and was also a musician. And I believe that because Holland did not grow up in Korea, she was always educating herself about the culture by seeking out people with expertise in various types of Korean dance, such as court dances, so that she could not only educate herself, but her students and the community at large. In the 1950s, Hala and some of her students performed in Waikiki at the Korean Village Restaurant, and later in the 50s or the 60s and 70s, uh, frequently her students performed at the Natsunoya Tea House, which is still happening, or there, it's there, we're not dancing there anymore. Uh, and the studio was invited many conventions uh, throughout the years. And also in the 70s and 80s, we performed in the, uh, it was called the Golden People Show. It was a multicultural show. And we performed uh, Coral Ballroom and then later at the Monarch Room in the, in the uh, Royal Hawaiian. And in 79, we performed at the Yakiniku Don Restaurant uh, seven nights a week, two shows a night, for a solid year, which gave students not only experience, but a little spending money. And Halam was very generous in that she could have just kept the fees, but she did give us a little uh, money to pay for our costumes. To help support herself and to help her studio going, she began working for the Star Travel Agency and would take groups to visit, mostly in Japan, but occasionally Korea, Taiwan, and other countries. While she was gone, she would always make sure that some of her advanced students would be available to teach. And in 1967, she brought Chung Won Meyer, or Chung Won Kim Meyer, daughter of Kim Chun Hun Sensing Nim, to become her assistant so that there could be continuity in the teaching. Ms. Kim taught not only Hala Hum's dances, but with her background from her father, court dances, as well as some Pukchum sequences. To further educate her students in 1972, Hala Hum arranged a study tour to Korea with the help of Ms. Kim and her father, and 10 of us went to study at the National Classic Music Institute, which at that time was on Namsan Hill, now called the Gugok Center in a different location. And um, our group was welcomed at the airport by Mr. Kim and some of his students with a big banner, made us feel really important. We learned the solo court dance Chuning Jun some Kayagom, and a couple of us learned a little bit of Pongsan Talchum. We also visited a mayor, the mayor, a children's home, saw some programs at the Institute, and when we came back to Hawaii, we did a little informal showing of what we had learned in room 36 in the music department. Halaham did go back and forth to Korea as much as she could and became very interested in shaman ceremonies. One of the studio's most outstanding concerts was in 1976 when Hala invited Gigi San, a shaman from the Seoul area, to come here and help her put together a concert, which was probably one of the most prolific times in her choreographic career, as she created several dances to go along with the ceremonies which Gigi San would do. It was a two-night concert with mostly different repertory each night and a cast of 60-plus dancers and extras, including my neighbor's uh, rooster, as well as live music provided by Ji Young Hee and Sung Myun, who were well-known treasured musicians from Korea who had come here in 1974. 
It was a highly successful and very educational experience for all, dancers as well as the audience. Halahom was a true performer, and in this short video clip from 1976 recital, you will see her taking on the role of the shaman while singing and dancing. Okay, well, I've timed myself several times, and I it should take exactly 17 minutes to get through, but so... Okay, I'll skip a few things. Uh, photo of Finding Aid. We do have an archive, which we started in 1998. have had many researchers come and look at what went on here. Uh, our studio has done many fundraising events, including fundraising for this building. Dr. Sa, the first director, uh, this is a, um, a doll color, uh, maker that came that Mrs. Hum arranged uh, with those wonderful dolls. He made them all. They were beautiful. And um, also, Judy Manzel did research, as well as Anne Nishiguchi did her master's thesis, uh, and also the wonderful documentary Billy Lee did called Moving Home. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, I guess we can't show that little video clip that we tried to, but let me just say a couple things. When I teach, and I should not be teaching Korean dance, but I am, uh, some of my favorite phrases that Halaham used to tell us is, you folks like chopstick dancing, or you need a little more ajinomoto inside your dance, or, you know, when you come to studio, you get other dance in your body, put in box, leave box, outside door, come with new body, learn new way to move. Those things, I think, are beautiful to remember because they're very apropos no matter where you go. And if we can't show that, too bad. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, and in conclusion, I'd like to, I believe that Halaham Dance Studio is the oldest continuous source of dance, Korean dance in the United States, and perhaps also in Korea. We've been going for slightly over 70 years, nonstop. And uh, my concern is, how much longer will it continue and who will take over the responsibility of keeping this wonderful legacy alive? Mahalo. Uh, you have my deepest, <laughs> deepest mahalo, Nuhi, Mary Jo. Okay, um, our next speaker is Dr. Yeri An from Korea, Academy of Korean Studies. And as you uh, see in the program, uh, our three Korean immigrant leaders, uh, Nodi Kim, Hesu Wang, and Hala Ham, influenced Chun Yun Hee, and she left her autho-ethnography author records. And Dr. An will share her story and legacy. Okay. Thank you, Dr. An. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yeli An. And I'm a professor of Korean uh, linguistics at the Academy of Korean Studies in Korea. And I was a visiting scholar here at the Center for Korean Studies. And I left here, uh, I left Hawaii last August. And it's really good to be back. And <laughs> yeah, I used to work on the second floor of this very building. And that's why I am prepared for the coldness of this building. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Thank you so much for inviting me to this meaningful event. And today I'm going to talk about um, Sajin Shinbu, a picture bride, Chun Yun Hee, focusing on her notes that she wrote. So uh, first, I'd like to briefly introduce Chun Yun Hee's life. She was born in the southern city of Jinju in 1896, and her family was rich and respected in the village. But her father passed away when she was young, and subsequently, she and her mother became Christians. Chen Yanyi attended um, private girls' school in Jinju, which was established by Australian missionaries. Um, yeah, it, it's on. Yeah, so I can, I can see this. Yes, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and at school, she learned Korean writing, classical Chinese, history, mathematics, geography, and so on. The seven year of such modern education allowed her to grow up as a modern woman, or a so-called sang in Korean. Unlike many other girls who became picture brides uh, because of poverty, Chanyeonhee volunteered to go to Hawaii to live in a free country, 
And in her notes, she recalled that she realized the importance of freedom and democracy at school. Chan Yeonhee came to Hawaii in 1915 and lived in Maui for seven years before moving to Oahu, where she spent the rest of her life. Thanks to the, uh, the modern, modern education, she gained the literacy, which was unusual for women at the time. By making full use of her ability, she served as a secretary of Korean Women's Relief Society. And you can see her name uh, in, the, in the official letter and also in the minutes. Not only uh, leaving these uh, official documents, she also left seven volumes of personal notes um, written uh, when she was in her 70s and 80s. The notes contain stories of her own life, uh, but also uh, they allow us to observe picture brides' individual experiences and connect those experiences to broader cultural, political, and social understandings. Her notes are numbered, and some have titles on the first page. Note 1 describes her childhood in Jinju and early stage of her life in Hawaii. And note 2 is 130 pages, which is the longest, and contains uh, the stories of Kung Min Hye or Dong Ji Hye, Korean Christian Institute, and so on. And some stories overlap. But uh, in general, she recounted her life with the passage of the time. And note three shows her later life in Hawaii. And there is no note four, so the number skips to five. And here is note six, seven, and eight. So this uh, this six hundred twenty-four page long. Notes are very important for many reasons. Most of all, they show vivid life stories of Korean picture brides in Hawaii, and she wrote that there were a few educated women among the picture brides, but no one ever wrote our stories yet, uh, which can be interpreted as the major motivation of her writing. In line with that, the notes also um, illustrate the role of women and women's society in Korean pioneer settlements. And from a bit different angle, the notes are the records showing the language use of first generation of Korean immigrants in Hawaii. So from now on, by focusing on these three points, let's go a bit deeper into her stories. As you can imagine uh, how hard it must have been for a 19-year-old girl uh, to leave her home country and uh, make a living in Hawaii, there were lots of uh, difficulties in her life, but she, uh, she um, kept moving on forward and overcame many difficulties. And I was curious where such courage and strength came from, and her notes helped tell us what enabled her to become such a strong woman was her, primarily her beliefs in certain values like freedom as a basic human right, right to receive an education, and a devotion to her nation. She witnessed the colonization of Korea in her school days, and she wrote about the discriminations and violence that she saw at school and uh, in her hometown. And she said the major motivating factor in, of her becoming a picture bride was to, to find freedom in life. So she believes that education can change one's life as it happened to herself, and then she also perceived education as the most important duty of a parent. And as you may know, she married three times, which must have not been easy decisions. And she recalled that the main reason for both of her divorces was uh, for the education of her children. She believed education as a means of fostering patriots. And she wrote, um, if you have wisdom and knowledge, you will not be a traitor to the state, but a lawyer person. So here you can see her, her beliefs in freedom, education, and patriotism 
are were all connected. So so far, we've been talking about Chinese personal faith uh, and uh, women's organizations such as Korean Women's Relief Society, were where women like Chinese could put their faith into practice. The patriotic ladies in Chinese word egungyasa encouraged each other and pursued their goals together. And this solidarity of women played a crucial role in terms of family stability, second generation education, Korean business, and in the end, the successful settlement of Korean immigrants. And this collective mind was also a key driver um, for the relief and fundraising activities and great contributions to Korean independent movements. Chanyani, uh, in her notes, expressed her gratitude to older ladies who came to Hawaii before picture brides arrived. Such older ladies took care of teenage picture brides like mothers or like sisters so that the young bride could successfully settle down. Uh, Chanyani personally got a lot of help from three women in Maui, Chun Elizabeth, um, Min Sara, Yi Guanxil, who offered what she needed and uh, who taught her how to live in plantation. And all those skills she learned from those older ladies were very important for her to make extra money to support her family. And her notes uh, says, not only older ladies, but younger women also helped each other when they were in crisis. And also they provided social protection to each other. These close ties between women also enabled the growth of Korean business in Hawaii. In a situation that many Koreans couldn't borrow money from a bank, they prepared their business money through K created by mutual trust between women. And, and she, uh, Chanyani uh, left a lot of episodes regarding the, the, the social activities of Korean Women's Relief Society. And as you may well know, um, they did not just collect donations, but they ran their own businesses like um, rice cake business, jelly food business, like making mu, I think, and then tegupo business and so on. And then um, all those activities were crucial for fundraising for Korean independence movements. And then uh, the successful fund fundraising could not be possible without the unity of these women. Um, and uh, Korean Women's Relief Society also assisted the Red Cross and Hawaiian society during World War II, like um, volunteering to fold the bandages for the wounded at the war, or like uh, selling food on the street, and so on. And here is a story that I want to share by reading Chanyeonhye's sentences. It's about taking care of Korean war prisoners during World War II. She said, um, Japan forcibly dispatched Korean news to small Pacific islands as Japanese soldiers. One day, the U.S. fleet attacked the island and brought the Korean news to Hawaii, locked them inside the barbed wire on Sand Island, and set up guards. Our Korean ladies, ladies were so heartbroken to hear this news. At that time, members of Korean Women's Relief Society, including Kim bok and Yeon made red pepper paste and kimchi, and then Kim je drove to Sand Island, delivered the food under the wire fence. Poor fellows of mine, the people of a country without freedom, it was very truly sad. The prisoners were very young men. Until our young, poor young people without a country left the island, the ladies of Korean Women's Relief Society occasionally cooked Korean food for them. This is the Korean spirit of Korean Women's Relief Society. Uh, I was really impressed by reading this part because I think it's kind of an unofficial record of uh, the activity of Korean Women's Relief Society. She also didn't forget about leaving her appreciation for female leaders like Nodi Kim or Hwang hye -soo. She said Nodi Kim devoted her whole life to the country and Hwang hye interpreted for Korean women who couldn't speak English like when they had to, uh, when they had legal issues or they had to go to hospital. 
And then Chen Yanyi said she thought of her as the mother of the Mother's Club. Chen Yanyi also wrote about um, um, first founding Korean women to establish the local society in Maui. So uh, when I read her notes, I tried to count the number of women in the notes, and there were like more than 50 female characters. So her notes are stories about Korean women who were mothers, heads of the household, entrepreneur, and social activists at the same time. And it's also about how women's communities functioned, prospered, and contributed to Korea and also to Hawaii. So um, let's move on to the last part of this presentation. As mentioned before, Chen Yanyi's notes are very unique language data because her linguistic background was kind of complicated. So Chen Yanyi was a native speaker of the late 19th and early 20th century Korean. And she was also a speaker of Jinju dialect. And she was exposed to Hawaiian pidgin English in plantations, and she also lived in an English-speaking society for decades, and her last husband was an um, English native speaker who couldn't speak Korean. So Chen Yanyi's notes shows that uh, her language use reflected the whole trajectory of her life. So Chen Yanyi used a lot of Jinju uh, southern dialect in her notes, for example, like Sorikil, Jeongji, Chante, uh, Hosebi, and so on. And when I looked up those words in dictionaries, many were not listed. So um, this, uh, her notes are like a rare documentation of Jinju dialect at the turn of the 20th century. And an interesting aspect of her using Korean language to me was like, um, some words seemed to be uh, fossilized in her lexicon. A lexicon is a, a personal dictionary in one's mind. And then um, what I mean by saying this is that um, she used a lot of modern words that were coined in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For example, gongisan meaning airplane, koksang, cook, kigechang, factory, dulsa, lawyer, bulgidung, telephone pole and Dangguang, basement, a street light. Oh, OK. Yeah. And Chabong Chim is like self-sewing needle, with meaning sewing machine, and Chono telephone. And those words were no longer used at the time that she wrote her notes, like in the 70s, 80s, and 80s. But she used those words so naturally, and she never used the word Chonhua or Chonhwagi meaning telephone, but she always used Chono uh, in the late 20th centuries. And then, so uh, while Korean language in Korea changed continuously, I think uh, as uh, her lexicon of Korean language kind of stopped expanding or changing at the time that she left Korea. Um, so, and then I looked up those words that she used in the dictionaries. Uh, like Gale 1931 is Korean English Dictionary, and Moon Se Young uh, 1938 is uh, the first Korean Korean Dictionary, and also like contemporary standard Korean Dictionary. And some some words were in the dictionaries, but some were not. So her notes are still waiting for some linguistic analysis. And another interesting aspect is her use of Hawaiian Pidgin English like kanaka, kao kao, nolo pupule, makuli, and so on. And then uh, these are Pigeon English words, and Pigeon English is like the mixture of English and local languages that plantation workers used as common language. And then in this case, uh, it's the mixture of English and basically Hawaiian, and but also the native tongue of the plantation workers like Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, and also Korean. And then her note shows that the penetration of local culture and language into overseas Korean. And I didn't show you the examples of her use of English words, but there were a lot. And then I personally was curious what word she used pidgin for and what, what word she used uh, English for. Yeah. 
So um, it's time to finish my presentation. So I'm going to just briefly summarize what we have been talking about. So I think Chanyani's notes is a reminder of uh, the life of Picture Bride and its hist historical significance. And her notes tell us the struggle and prosperity of early Hawaiian Korean community, where women became the main characters. And her notes are also her showing the variations and changes of Korean language in Hawaiian Korean diaspora. Thank you so much for listening. Mics are ready, so uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to raise your hand and our student assistant will come to you. Um. It's not necessarily a question, but I would really like to see the clip uh, of Halaham interacting with her students. So would that be possible? I hope it's not too long. Okay. Is it possible for us to do that? Uh, it's not the sequence we teach now. Halaham was very good about improvisation. And I was at the program and was astonished at what I saw. Uh, but uh, she never failed to come up with surprises. So, um, yeah. Uh, and the, the video that you saw with her talking with the student... What I used to do sometimes is set up my video camera in the studio when she was around and just turn it on and let it go. Because I never, she was all in and out so much that I really wanted to be able to somehow also learn the dances that way. But I felt it was important to, for the future people to sort of see, you know, what her philosophy was. And so, um, even one time when she stayed with me, Billy Lee, who made the doc documentary, you'll see curtains flapping and near the end of the video. That's my house, where she was staying and practicing, always trying to get better. And she used to say, even fingernail has to dance. You have to know how to catch the student and how to, or the audience and pull them into you. Yeah, so uh, I feel I'm very happy I had a video camera. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Floor is open. Please raise your hand. Uh, you know, I'm very curious about the role of the church and missionaries, especially, you know, because the effect of the missionaries all over the world is very controversial. But I, I hear that um, many of these women uh, converted to Christianity and that that was a part of their um, resistance. And so I'm just curious about uh, the role of the church. And also since um, in, 20, in the 21st century, the church has become um, a tool of the right wing in many circles. So I'm, I'm wondering about the early church for Korea in the 1800s and 1900s. Um, actually, Hawaii Korean history is uh, Korean church history. Uh, the, the first, particularly the first group of, uh, first group who left the uh, Incheon December uh, 22nd, most of them were en encouraged by the Jap American missionaries, particularly Jones, Heber Jones. He was the uh, pastor of Incheon Church as well as the superintendent of Gyeonggi District. And he went around to all the churches. He encouraged the woman, particularly the church, church members, to move to Hawaii because Korea suffered for a couple of years of drought and the economically was very hard. And he saw the uh, you know, opportunity that Koreans were better in Hawaii. So, and 
those who accompanied the first group and later on as well, mostly the church goers. So women were more Americanized, uh, let's say, you know, and uh, they learned the alphabet through reading the Korean Bible. So they could be the first, uh, first group actually modernized in Korea at that time, and they are the ones who came here. And as, lo as soon as they landed over here, and actually on the ship, they had a prayer meeting every day. And uh, the first board, 50 members of our Korean, uh, I mean, uh, Christ uh, Christian members, but when they landed in Hawaii, at 14 days from Japan to here, the number increased to 58. So actually, it's the act of a missionary or the Christianity act in a, happened in the, in the immigration board. And as soon as they landed here, actually, they had, had a, a prayer meeting. And the present Christ United Methodist Church was organized on November 10, 1903. So the history, 120-year history was Korean-American history as well as Korean-American Christian church history. So you are right, the church played a very strong role. And as I said earlier, it's not only a Methodist church. Episcopal church was also organized in 1905, end of 1905. And the independent church was organized in 1918. So actually, all throughout, the Christian churches played a heavy role. In Hayes' story, Christianity was key to her being uh, a liberated woman. And so I think it's all contextual, because myself, I am very against the colonization of the Hawaiians, you know, and that history that we're still fighting. But in her case, from her own words, when they escaped when she was 13 years old, um, her in-laws tried to kill her older sister because she was Christian, and their only option to have a better uh, life was to go to a Christian mission. So she had to exchange uh, working as a cook and a housekeeper for a room board and school fees, but then they gave her a scholarship to, to uh, get educated, being the first one of the first um, Asian women to get a college degree. So that wouldn't have been possible without the Christian church being involved. So I think it's instrumental in terms of women's, right? Now, I wouldn't say so much for men because they were always given the opportunity. They were, you know, um, educated without question. They all were required to go to school, but Girls were not valued except for as wives and uh, mothers. So I found that, you know, that history is very important. Uh, Ned, please. Let me try this. Hey, uh, thank you, ladies. You do much better than men do when they give lectures. <laughs> but uh, I wanted this question. I, I, I truly appreciate the role of Christianity. But I'm also wondering about the fact that Koreans ultimately were probably much more urban than the other ethnic groups. Uh, like Ducky, by the 1920s, 30s, what percentage of the population, Korean population, were actually urban as opposed to rural? Do you know? What, what percentage were urban as opposed to being rural? In other words, by, by 1920, 25, what percentage of the Korean population? Sorry, they don't have breakdown. Only the, only the total population in each county. So they don't have breakdown on how many. But overall, the male and female ratio was 10 to 1 at the beginning, and later on became 8 to 1, 7 to 1. So you can just, you know. But I, I'm wondering like if that. perhaps because my, my inkling was a much larger percentage of Koreans living in Honolulu, Wahiwa, major cities by the 1920s, 30s. And I'm, th I'm wondering if that urban base helped bring the women together more easily, where they could get together, form their relief funds, uh, relief societies. 
And, uh, you know, the churches were there. And if that didn't also help with the acculturation. Well, the Korean women were, uh, unlike the other, you know, the Japanese, it's rather than an urbanized people, rather than the farmer themselves, particularly those who came to Hawaii, or although Korea wasn't urbanized at that time, but the comparatively speaking, they are not the farmers. So when they came over here, more or less, they, uh, at the plantation, they helped, but they easily move out because they did not have a contract. They are not the contract laborer. They were free. Actually, they could move around. So their mobility was a lot easier than other ethnic groups. Okay? And as I said, uh, because they were Christian, they attended the church as well as the, some attended the missionary school. Is schools are uh, established by the missionary school. So they were way ahead of uh, average Koreans at, at home at that time. So uh, it's natural they become uh, mother hen in Hawaii. <laughs> Back, yeah, I have a question. I think uh, uh, women in early Korean immigrant community are different from the women who lived in Korea, Joseon or Korea. And also men in Korea were also different, I think, allowing or at least enduring women being so active. So what made the women in Hawaii so different? And also, what made Korean immigrants who were living here, you know, endure or at least accommodate or at least transform themselves to be a little bit more, you know, supportive of women activity in Hawaii? So was it American culture? Was it because of the women who were here uh, stronger than others? Or why? why? The, uh, the difference, I think, uh, from various aspects, I would like to hear uh, the, about that. Oh, because a woman is woman, and woman. <laughs> uh, when the picture bride came, about 680, or I mean, you know, about 700 picture bride came. Their husbands were already 10, 15 years old. Or some, some cases, they were about their father's age, 20 years older than themselves. So by the time they arrived, a couple of years later, most husbands were no longer able to work the plantation. So women actually carried the responsibility supporting the families. So they had to do it. There was no choice. They had to do Whatever it's possible to make money, they had to do it. So that's one thing. But the other one was that those picture brides who came over here uh, actually had some uh, education in Korea, middle school and the high school education. So they were way ahead of uh, their husband's intellectual level or educational level. So they were able to do what they wanted to do. And because of they were the wage earner of the family, they could do whatever they do. They don't have to beg some spending money from their husbands to do uh, their organizational activities. So Koreans were also able to do on their own whenever their uh, needs arise. Those who came the early 1903, 1905, they were ultra-venturesome women. All the husbands said, let's go to Hawaii. If they were not the venturesome, they would not follow their husbands. Because most of the men who were married at that time left their wives behind. Because those wives didn't want to come. So those who came at the early age were already venturesome, as well as a picture of rice later on. Thank you. We do want to take a pic. Uh, Questions from the audience. Are there anybody who wants to ask questions? Hi, um, my question is for Mary Jo. 
Um, are dance classes still being taught? And if so, when are the classes and how can we sign up? <laughs> okay. Uh, I teach five days a week at the studio. I teach the Korean class in the music department once a week. I've been doing that 25 years. I've been involved 60 years with the studio. I started teaching in 1974-75 in the studio. Yes, we have classes. You can look at my schedule. It won't mean anything to you because there are names of people who come at certain times. We have a website. We have a telephone number. Uh, I will give it to you afterwards. If you're hungry, you go down and you can eat, buy your groceries and enjoy. Yeah, so I have classes at various times. Uh, I don't usually teach Tuesday or Sunday at the studio, but every other day I'm there. And you're welcome to call my cell. I'll give it to you in a few minutes. Before ending, I would like to suggest one thing today. Uh, the Kim Nodi, Chan Yani, Hwang Su were all recognized by the Ministry of uh, Patriots and, uh, and Veterans Affairs. In other words, they all got Order of Merit for National Foundation. Kim Nodi got in 2021, Chan Yani got 2022, Hwang Su got 2019. Of four presentations today, Hallaham. And the presenter, Mary Jo, did not get Munha Hunjang. So it's time for Hawaii Korean, Korean community petition to Korean government to, give, to recognize the effort carrying on the, the oldest Korean dance studio outside Korea. I don't know whether they will give a, a culture of Hunjang uh, Hunjang to foreigners or outside of Korea. However, they can make us exceptional uh, exception, and they can award that prize. Okay, so maybe Director Pack can organize a petition or something. And thank you. Trina kept on alluding to some very interesting stories she had to have, tell, and I think uh, we'd like to hear some. Well, this is just kind of our funny family uh, stories, but when my cousins and my uncle and aunt went to North Korea to find the homestead, you know, the actual site of... Um, where the house was. And apparently they went to the spot where my grandfather was supposedly heroically crossing the Yalu River. And it was like you could step over <laughs> into it. <laughs> so we, we sort of preferred the myth of him, you know, trekking uh, courageously over the ice, but you know, it could have changed over the years, so who knows? But anyway, it was, it, it's just so funny to compare, you know, reality with, with some of the family myths that uh, are carried on. But I did want to share one thing because um, Hesu really had to service uh, the families at their worst. You know, they, she would be called in the middle of the night to do interventions for the families and many um, abusive domestic violence situations, which really wasn't talked about very much at that time. And so my mother would go with her when she was a teenager and wait in the car. So we would always hear stories about, oh, there was yelling and knives flying through the air. <laughs> so, you know, the Korean temper, um, kind of characteristic was always kind of emphasized when they talked about these social work interventions. But I'm sure it was real. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your funny story. Um, 
We have about five minutes left, so uh, okay, we can take a few more questions. Hi, this is for Professor Yerian. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I just was wondering, because you talked about a little bit of her value and how she recognized and talked about other women leaders and what's happening, but was there some stuff about her family life as well, how she kind of balanced family and also, you know, being involved in this community work and how she felt about it? Was there some challenges? Was uh, a husband not enduring it enough? I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, if I remember correctly, um, she, of course, mentioned of her, her family in Hawaii, but I think she more wrote about her family in Jinju. And, and she wrote about her daughters and sons and then especially Mary, uh, who uh, was very close to her mother. And um, I think you were wondering, like, she did so many, like, uh, she played so many roles at the same time. So you were wondering how she balanced her, like, work life and then social activities life and then home life. Uh, she, I, for that, I think I don't have a good question because she didn't really wrote a lot about her her ordinary lives at home because she was so busy working, like taking care of all the businesses. Um, but what she um, emphasized all the time when mentioning her children was like uh, how much she tried hard to give them good um, education or opportunities. And then she really appreciated her own mother in Jinju because her mother gave her a very a good opportunity to get education um, in a country that did not really have good opportunities for general women. And then she decided that she was in, a, in America in a good situation for giving her children good education. So um, she, when she uh, mentioned about the reasons of her divorces, she said, like um, um, her first husband, Kil Chan-no, uh, was not very capable of supporting family. So she decided that she could not give her children good educational opportunities because her family was so poor. And, and she said that was the main reason. And for her second husband too, like Park Dae-sung, um, he promised to, to give her children good education, but she, he... Um, objected her first daughter, uh, her daughter to go to college because he wanted her daughter to make money for her family. And then she appreciated the most to her third husband, who was an American soldier, that he took care of her children the most very well. And then she said, there is no color or nationality in terms of love, love for family. And you married the three times, as uh, Professor An said. The reason was the education of her children. First husband was Suljengi. She used the term Suljengi, alcoholic, and he 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 makes money and he spends, you know, overnight spending. Anyway, although she married three times, in her mind. Her education of ilbu jongsa, woman has to sub carry only one husband. It was all her mind. So when the first husband died, you know, many years after they divorced, and he attended a different church, Kiamoku Church at the time, and she attended the Lilia Church, but she came to uh, Kiamoku Church to give a farewell party for a first husband funeral. So although she, by necessary, she had to divorce their husband,
But in her mind, she had a guilty of having two, three you know, husbands. So <laughs> she was modern yet was a you know, classical woman. I understand we have a descendants of a Chanyani today, right? Granddaughter, do we, she left? Yeah, she is. So do you want to say a few words? From, from what I know, my grandmother, um, as Duki said, was um, her children uh, and their education was first and foremost. And she had a real tough life, but she was a tough woman, as many of them were in those days. And it seemed to me, from what I know, is that every time she got ahead, it's like the rug was pulled out from under her and she had to start all over again. But she, she managed to um, persevere and... Um, yeah, and she raised her five kids, and yeah, and as I said, uh, as Dukey mentioned, um, she, she would also say that her first two husbands they were just drunks, you know. <laughs> she, was, she had to, you know, she had to um, um, fend for the family. You know, that was her main uh, purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Chanyani's manuscript had been uh, published actually. Uh, First, uh, in original uh, words, uh, and uh, with a uh, transformed uh, into recent current Korean language as well, and it was published by uh, some scholars and uh, the kids' efforts. And uh, uh, we, the center, initially had uh, the manuscript in our collection, but we decided to donate it to uh, the Academy of Korean Studies, Chang Seoga, and they. Uh, digitized it, and the digitized version is given to us. So probably we will be making use of it. And then Professor Anyeri is from Academy of Korean Studies. So we are very happy that Academy of Korean Studies not only publishing the book, but also uh, produced a professor who is still working on Chanyani's manuscript. Thank you very much, Anyeri, Professor Anyeri, for doing this. You want to hear, I mean, learn about a little bit more about Chanyan He. Chanyan He's daughter, who came 1915 as a picture bride, she attended the uh, uh, present high school, uh, sec second year. She was one year shy of a graduating high school at that time. All her classmates were so excited to learn about picture of Hawaii going to Hawaii, they, although they don't know what Hawaii was and all that. All her classmates all went home and they told their husband, uh, parents that they want to go Hawaii as a picture bride. They all their parents said no, but Chanyani's mother was the only woman mother said go. As long as you can go there and live long life, because her uh, siblings all died early, and uh, so Chanyani's mother had this guilty feeling: What kind of woman am I? What you know crimes did I commit in my previous life? Have losing so many children. So as long as my daughter, you go Hawaii, live long, then go. That's how she was able to leave the home. And Chanyan Lee lived 101 years old. And now her, her mother, Chanyan's daughter, is 104 years old. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your presence today. And um, okay, uh, now it's about time. And uh, please join me to give a big round of applause to our speakers for their amazing story. Yeah. On behalf of Korea, uh, Center for Korean Studies, um, I'd like to say thank you, mahalo, kamsamnida, to all of you and each one of you 
to join us to celebrate the uh, 120th celebration of Korean immigration. Thank you so much. <laughs>